All right, good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone. Um, we have the privilege of studying the Haftorah of uh, Amos today from the book of Amos for Parshat Vayeshev. Um, and there's a ton to cover, so we're going to dive right in. It is in your stone, Chumash, if you have one, on page 1142. Thank you, uh, those who shared that. If you're in your, if you're in your uh, Chumash, it is, begins on verse uh, chapter two, verse, or in your Tanakh, it's chapter two of Amos, verse six. That's where it starts. Um, uh, and we're going to, we'll, we'll dive in from there. So let's just talk a little bit about Amos. It's the first time we encompass him, we, we encounter him during this, uh, during this cycle. Amos is in the later uh, prophet section in the Nevi'im, uh, Nevi'im uh, in the Preasar, in the quote-unquote minor prophets. Um, and so we expect, right, that the story we get from Amos is going to be prophecy and prose as opposed to stories. Um, so that, and that's what, that will hold true. Who is Amos? So at the very beginning of his book, we're told some biographical information about him. Chapter 1, um, uh, verse 1, Divrei Amos, these are the words of Amos. That he's he's either in Nokdim or from Nokdim uh, or he's in Nokid, me Tekoa from Tekoa, Asher Chazal Yisrael, that he prophesies concerning Israel. So uh, just a little bit, we know who is he talking to when we say Israel. We don't just mean um, he's prophesizing about the Jewish people, but in particular, he's prophesizing about who? The North Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom. kingdom. The Northern Kingdom. He's not the first prophet we've seen talk to the Northern Kingdom, but this is post schism after the division between the North and the South, prophesizing to the Northern Kingdom about the eighth century, let's say, or maybe a little later. Um, uh, but what's interesting is he's from Tekoa. Where's Tekoa? Where's Tekoa today? Anyone know? Anyone ever been to Tekoa? The West Bank, maybe? It's in, it's, it's all right in, over the Green Line. It's in Gush Etzion. It's, it's in Gush, yeah. It overlooks that. actually the Dead Sea area, uh, which is interesting. It overlooks, it's like on the on the edge of Midbar Yehuda of the Judean Desert. But which tribe is it a part of? I sorry, gave it away that said it's in the Judean Desert. What tribe is it a part of? Judah. Judah. <laughs> so this is unique that we have a southerner, a member of the Judean kingdom, being sent as a prophet to the northern kingdom. Right? And that sort of makes Amos very unique. And that he is from the southerner, he's from the south, meaning he's from the kingdom of Yehuda, of Judah. He himself probably uh, 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 belongs to the tribe of Yehuda, and he is prophesizing in the north. And that's part of Amos's uh, flair, is that he is uh, from a different, uh, a different area. Sort of, we even see Amos sort of use puns that make more sense for him than do for his listeners, which makes sense. If you think about bringing a Southerner to the North, their pun might be different just based on the, their dialect. And so we see some of that in Amos. Um, but, but, in, but he has this unique perspective. He is a begrudging prophet. He doesn't really want to be a prophet. He's sort of pushed into this. And that's sort of very clear at the beginning words, right? He's a no -cade. He's either a shepherd or there's a very large book written by a guy by the name of Richard Steiner, who's a PhD at, uh, probably, I think at, he used to teach at YU. He taught in other places that he thinks a no kid really means a sycamore farmer. I'm not exactly sure what a sycamore farmer is, but it's just a different, uh, a different role. Um, but uh, that is, that is uh, Amos. And he's speaking to, as the verse continues, we may, Uziah Melchudah, during the time of Uziah, the king of Yehuda, Uvmei Yeravam ben Yoash, Melech Yisrael, and to the northern king, to the king of Yeravam, or Jeroboam in English, of Yoash, the king of Judah. This is typically referred to in the uh, academia, this is Yeravam II, Jeroboam II, right? That's who he's referring to. And, and we'll, we'll just read verse number two, chapter one, I'm going to share my screen here so you can see it. Chapter 1, verse 2. Vayomer, and this is the opening prophecy for everything. Vayomer Hashem Mitzion Yishag. 
God proclaims like a lion from Zion, um tenkolo, and from Jerusalem, he gives God gives God's voice, Navot Roim, and the pastures of uh, of of the shepherds should be dried out. Achlu here me of uh, lu, excuse me, is uh, is means not to mourn, but to be like to to be thirsty for water, right? On the Aves Rosha Carmel, and the summit of Carmel should wither for rain, right? One of the big issues in the northern kingdom is the need for rain, the need for rain, and they, he's sort of playing on that that God is uh, withholding the rain for their lack of deeds. Um, and right off the bat, you sort of hear this, uh, and we'll come back to this. This is a motif that he uses a lot, but I wanted to use this imagery. First of all, Hashem mi mitzion yishag, God roars. Yishag is a, the way a lion roars, right? It's not just a roar, but a, a lion's roar. God roars like a lion. Mitzion, Sion is where? North or south? Northern kingdom or southern kingdom? Southern. Southern. southern kingdom. Where is that? North or south? Southern. south? southern. So right off the bat, there is this polemic against the northern kingdom that God's direction, the divine worship, the connection to the oh, Almighty yeah. is from the south. So right off the bat, there's a political element to what he's saying over here by using Sion and Yerushalayim as standing <coughs> place for where God is on this political piece. But there's actually a much deeper piece here as well. Um, you can all see my screen. So yeah. we found Yerevam's coin, his seal, his signet. And it is this. This is an impression of it, right? What, wow. is, his, what is his royal sign? A lion. A lion. A lion. So when, you're, when, <coughs> when Amos is using the lion imagery over and over again, which we will see today, it's not just describing God as a fierce animal, but it is a political attack against the king who he's rebuking. Say, you think you're a the lion? You think everyone should listen to you because you're the fierce apex predator? No, we should listen to God. God gives the true voice. It's God's word we should listen to, right? Choosing the lion on purpose is a way of, of attacking sort of the, uh, <coughs> the image of the king. And by the way, just for, uh, for continuity's sake, does anyone remember the five lira coin? Yeah. I right, do. that lion, that's Sherevam's lion that makes it to his coin. It wasn't a great king, he wasn't such a great guy, but it is our ancestral roots to Israel. And so we have Jeroboam, lion, make it to the coin. That's where it came from. It's not on the new shekels. It's on the liras, which are the old. We have the new Israeli shekel, right? This is the old Israeli shekel. But that's where that lion comes from. That's a reference to Yeravam. That's what Amos is highlighting every time he talks about the lion raising his voice. It's a political nudge, a knock against the king who he is debating against. All right, with that, we're going to dive straight into our Haftorah. And um, just to set up the frame, our Haftorah begins all the way in chapter two, but the rest from chapter one, verse three, all the way to chapter two, is one continual prophecy. And it starts, I'm just going to read a little bit to get our, our understanding. Komar Hashem, so says God, al shlosha pishay da mesek. On the three, I'll actually reshare my screen so you can, for those who don't have it directly in front of them. For three, for on three sins of Damasek, of the north, of Damascus, of Syria, the Arba, Lo Shivenu, and the fourth, I will not uh, return. I will punish them for um, because they treated the, they, 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 they threshed, they treated poorly the people of Gilad. Mishilach, the Eish, Bebe, uh, uh, and I'll send a fire in the, pas in the palace of Tazael, Bachlar, Menot, Ben Hadad, and I'll destroy the fortress of Ben Hadad. Skipping a verse, the next one, Komar Hashem, and you see the pattern. So says the Lord, Azah, 
for the three transgressions of Asa, Barbalo Shivano on the fourth. I will not be, uh, uh, I won't return, meaning I will hold them accountable for it. Um, for they, uh, for they return the population of uh, Galut to who, because they did the sin, whatever, and therefore, the Shalakti Esh, I will send fire, the Chuzo, the Chomot Asa, the fortress of Asa, and I will do X, Y, and Z. Next one, Komar Hashem, Al Shoshat Sor. For the three sins of Sor, Varlo Shivanu, on the fourth, I won't return. And therefore, I'm going to send fire in them. <laughs> the next one, Komar Hashem, Al Shoshat Edom, for the three sins of Edom. So we see the pattern here, right? God yes. is taking them to task this three and four, whether it's that means seven or it's a compounding of it, whatever it is. This isn't our so I can spend too much part in it. But we see the frame. We see the reframe, right? He is addressing all the nations. He's trying to heat up. Damasek, Aza, Soar, Edom, Amo, Moab. Those are all the people that he addresses. Who? What is this? Where are all these geographically located? Around Israel. All around Israel. And what is he attacking them for? For their poor treatment of Jews. Right? Amos is an incredibly talented orator. And he bridges his message to bring in the reader. So what you're listening to Amos, imagine him standing on a corner, on a soapbox, announcing the word of God. What's he saying? Those people who treated you bad to the north, God won't countenance anymore. God will punish them. Those who treated you bad to the south, God won't countenance anymore. God will punish them. Those who treated you bad to the west, to the east, God won't countenance anymore. God will punish them. Going through all the, all the sinners, all the enemies of the people, right? We like that, right? I would listen to that. These people treated us badly. How do they treat them bad? And then he goes on, the beginning of chapter, uh, or right before, a couple of verses before us, chapter two, verse six, two verses before our Torah starts. Ko amar Hashem al shoshah pishay, I'm oh, sorry, chapter two, verse four. Ko amar Hashem, so says God, al shoshah pishay Yehuda, for the three sins of Judah, the arba lo shivenu, and the fourth, I will not be requited, I will, I will bring the fight to them. Because they spurned the word of God, so on and so forth. I'm going to send fire down on Judah and eat the fortress of Jerusalem, consume the fortress of Jerusalem. Right? The northern kingdom's jumping with glee, right? It's not their enemy, it's their rival. But what happens? Enter our Torah, and this, if you have it in front of you, you can follow along where we are now. Chapter 2, verse 6. Koamar Hashem, so says God, Yisrael, on the three sins of, of, of the kingdom of Israel, and the fourth I will not be requited, because you sold the righteous for silver, for low profit, and traded the needy for a pair of, of, of sandals. You trample the heads of the poor, the deraf anavim yitu, and you pervert the, the way of the uh, of the righteous, of the humble. And a man and a father both go to profane God. To proframe the holy name of God. So right off the bat, this rhetoric sort of implodes in their face. And this is very typical Amos rhetoric. Bring them in. Your enemies, they're bad all around. And Judah, your rival, they're bad. You know who's worse? We get a whole sure. list of the litanies of sins of Israel. The focus is clearly on the climax. Israel. And what is the focus? What is the focus? First of all, we see the part of the reason why this Haftorah is chosen for our Parsha, this reference to selling the poor for sandals. What does that remind you of? Sale of Joseph. Sale of Joseph. This is where that Midrash comes from, right? It's not in the text, but 
it's in the it's in the it's it's the midrash, and so we build this parallel between the sale of Joseph and this this issue. What does it mean in shot? What is Amos telling them? He's not critiquing them for the sale of Joseph. What's he actually critiquing them? For taking advantage of the poor. Taking advantage of the poor, exactly. And this reference, which sort of helps build the point the Midrash says, why does Midrash say they sold them for a pair of shoes? Why does it say they sold them for, you know, cheap tickets to the Mets game? Like, why, why, why a pair of shoes? Yes, it came from here. So it came from here, but what's the image that the, the Navi is trying to think? When you sell someone, when you sell someone for a profit, right? It's one thing that, why does someone get sold into slavery in Jewish tradition? Because they're a debtor. They're a debtor and or? They were committed of a stealing. They stole something and they can't pay it back. So because they're a debtor, right? It all comes down <laughs> to poverty. These are vulnerable people who, who, who are impoverished. They get sold into slavery, but the question becomes, how do you relate to them? Are you selling them? Are you taking advantage of that sell? <laughs> are you trading people as commodity for another commodity for a set of pair of shoes, right? When you, part of the question becomes how you interact with this person. And that's part of the story of Joseph also. It's one thing when they are so upset at him as their brother, but it gets to a point where they engage with Joseph in such a way that it's like he's a commodity. He's not even a human, right? They don't even treat him as a human. They train him for a pair of shoes, right? It, it, it's this sort of like, uh, take him for free. Oh, we'll take a pair of flip-flops for him, right? It's not this expensive, regal shoes that we're talking about. It's, it, it's shoes or shoes. They're just there to protect your feet. And, and, and part of what the prophet, what Amos is critiquing the Northern Kingdom here is that they treat the poor for this sort of substandard, right? They sell them for kesa, for silver, not even for gold, right? They sell them, they trade them for a bunch of shoes. Like it's not, a, not even worth it for them. The second part of this message is an important note on what it means when you fail on a moral level to your friend, right? Part of the, the, you know, the standard issue profit is uh, this comment about social justice, about treating people properly, about making sure you don't take advantage of the vulnerable. That is so much the message of the Nevi'im, of the prophets. But part of that message is that when you don't treat others or you take advantage of the weak, it's not just that you're treating them poorly, but that in turn reflects a fundamental chilo Hashem, a fundamental desecration of God's name. You do all of this to profane God's name. And that's part of this, this, this uh, Haftorah as well, the understanding that uh, their, their poor relationship with others impacts their spiritual standing with God as well. That's verse number eight. Continuing on. Val Bigadim Um Chavulim. You recline on the clothing of pledges. What is this? What's this referring to? Right? So you take a loan from someone, right? You or sorry, you give a loan to someone, and then you want collateral. So what do you do? You take their garments. Garments are very expensive. You take their winter coat, right? So the Torah has a special law. You have to return. If you take someone's coat, you have to return it to them in the day so that they can use it, right? You can't take something like a coat or something they need, a threshing uh, stone or something like that. You can't take their pots, their pans, right? You have to return them so they can prepare food for themselves, right? What are they doing? They take the garments of pledges, meaning they, they are supposed to be returning them, but they haven't. And the way they do, they recline by their altar. They think that that's a form of divine service. They think they're so holy. They're sitting in shul with the coats and, and the clothing that they took that they should be returning. Um, 
And therefore, verse number nine, and I destroyed the Amorites before them. I destroyed the Amorites who were tall like uh, cedars and stout like oaks. I brought them down. I brought you up from Egypt. You have a sacred purpose. And I brought you 40 years in the desert to train you to act a certain way. To inherit the land of the Amorites. But you should have known better. Don't you remember when you were in Egypt, you were poor, you were vulnerable. I made from your children prophets. And from your prize students, Linzerim, to uh, to uh, Nazarites, people who have this close connection to God. Is that not so, O oh, people of Israel? And what do you do with that? Verse 20, Shans and Zerim Yayin. You made the prophets, I'm sorry, you made the Nazarites, those that were committed to living a certain life, engaged with God. You made them drink wine and violate their oath. And to the prophets, Sivitam, Lemor, Lo Tenabu. You 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 order the prophets, don't prophesize, don't teach, don't share God's word. Um, and therefore, I'm gonna make your 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 uh your uh, movements way down like a wagon. And the other, uh, uh, verse 14, the Avad Minsos Mikal, and your ability to flee will, the, the swiftness will, will, will move away. The Chazek Lo Yamitz Kocho, and the, the strong cannot, will not find their strength. The Gibor Lo Yimale Venasho, and even the courageous won't survive, won't last with their life. And the bowmen won't be able to stand on the ground. I think in the art school, it says they won't be able to hold their ground, right? What does it say? 15. The Chabad says, uh, and he who holds the bow shall not stand. So not stand. Mm. Now, either that means they won't be able to hold their ground, they won't be able to hold their line. It also might mean in the ancient ways, one of the ways that they had distance for your bow was you had to really pull it back far. And they had this contraption where you would stand on the base of the bow so that you could get better pullage. Either way, it doesn't matter, what it, it, but I think the message is clear. And the light-footed won't be able to escape. And the horseman won't be able to flee for his life. And the uh, those that are those that are um, those that are uh, uh, the warriors, the strong warriors, will run away naked. On that day, when God declares, when God brings His punishment on on, on the people, it's a very dark, very very dark <laughs> prophecy, very angry prophecy, and part of the prophecy also is this rebuke, we saw a little about this, that they sit by their uh, verse, um, verse eight. Part of this is also their worship, their cultic worship of idolatry, that they sort of replace God for their own benefit. Those that serve Baal, we've talked about Baal a lot. Baal becomes like the, the choice idolatry. But Baal isn't just, you know, they're serving a different God. The idolatry is much more pernicious. It changes the paradigm of how they relate to God. Why do you serve Baal? Baal will give me rain and I need rain, right? What's the point of me serving God then? It's nothing more than a business arrangement. If I sadden my God up, then I'm gonna get the rain. It's a good investment. It's protection money to the, to the mob. That perverts the relationship that we're supposed to have with God. It's not supposed to be transactional. It's not supposed to be, I will serve, therefore I will get. It's supposed to be elevated, lofty. It's supposed to be about our striving for ambition and spirituality for our connection with the divine to fulfill the divine will. And that perversion is part of what we speak about over here. And what Amos laments, verse 11, 
I made your prior children prophets. I made them nazirim. What is a nazir? A nazir puts away what they deserve, what they can get in the world, even what's mutar, even what's permitted, to focus on the relationship with God. And you reject those people. You make them drink wine. You tell them don't prophesize. And this posits us into the end of the Torah, chapter three. Shimu et devar et hadavar zeh. Listen to this thing, to this word. Asher diber Hashem alechem b'nei Yisrael that I spoke to you, O Israel. And again, listen to the clever rhetoric of Amos. Al kol mishpacha asher al kol mishpacha asher leiti meretz b'tzrayim lemor. I chose Israel, the whole family that I brought up from Egypt. You're special. Rak etchem yadati mikol mishpachot adama. Only you, Israel, I have a special relationship with, right? That should be good. The listener is like, yes, we're close to God. Comes the other shoe. Therefore, we'll hold you doubly accountable for all of your iniquities, for all of your sins, right? There's this, this almost is this bait and switch. Only you have a special relationship with God, and therefore you're doubly damned, right? There's this, this. Build up in this rhetoric that almost is, you could just imagine the listener, you know, I, they get this, this terrible crescendo. And then, Shimu, listen to this word. You have this close relationship with God. I would imagine it continues with, so you'll do tshuva and you'll be okay. You'll repent. God won't forsake you forever. No, almost goes straight for the jugular. Right as you're expecting relief, straight for the jugular continues or ends this with a series of rhetorical images for people to think about, to highlight the idea that everything has a cause and effect. Every effect has its cause and every cause has its result. Can two walk on the same path and not bump into each other, not meet? Again, here we have the lion. Does the lion roar, the tariff ain't low? And it doesn't have its prey. A tank fear below. Does the little lion, does the cub, again, sort of this, remember, the king is parading as a lion, and the prophet is using that metaphor to describe God's dominance. It's like putty in his hand. Um, all these are these different ideas. So the bird drops the land if it does it's not how it on a, a trap. If there's no snare, does a trap spring up if it hasn't caught anything? In the Takao Shofar ear, does a horn sound, does the Shofar sound in the town, signaling war, signaling Shuva, the Am Lo Yecharadu, and the people aren't alarmed, they're not scared. In Tira Ra'ab Ba'ir, is there a misfortune that comes to a town, Ba'ashem Lo Asa, and God didn't cause it? Do things happen to nations that isn't controlled by God? In Lo Yasa Hashem, Davar, Kim Galas Hodo, Alabadav and Ibrahim. Indeed, God does nothing without revealing it to God's God's servants, the prophets, Arye Yishag. Again, this repetition of the lying imagery. And now we know why it's repeated. Three times so far we've come in these two chapters. And that's because of how powerful this image is. Arye Yishag, Milo Yira, does the lion roar, does not uh does not uh, does not everyone fear Hashem? Does the Lord speak? Milo Yinaveh. Does the God speak? And does someone dare not prophesy? Right again. This is also an allusion to Amos's reluctance. He doesn't want to be a prophet, but God's speaking to him. Who can dare refuse God's mission? This is where our Torah ends. Right. This is where our Torah ends. It's very intense. It's very angry. It has no tempering. And it's very direct. It's perfect. It's beautifully crafted. It's one of, I always say, Amos is my favorite prophet. The, 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 the richness of the way he presents his argument, the beautiful oration, the way he structures this, it's like a, 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 an art, a work of art, bringing people in, confounding their expectation, and then to sort of bashing them over the head. Um, and that part's not so great, but you, you get the seriousness of his message. I, so we see some obvious connections to our Torah, to our Parsha, right? The, to the, the Yosef sale. I want to highlight one piece. Highlights what we said, and this sort of will be our where we'll end. 
What are criteria we talked about for half Taurus? What, what, what makes half Torah? There's some connection to our Parsha, some reflection of themes. How long should it be? 21, 21 verses. 21 verses. And should it end on a positive note or a negative note? Positive. Positive. Every half Torah has words of consolation. Where are the words of consolation in this half Torah? That's, right? yeah. recall, last week or two weeks ago, we actually even add words to the end of uh, Ovadia because we're worried that the Torah isn't correct. That, I'm sorry, that's so down. It's so devastating. <laughs> we add words. We repeat the last, the second to last verse of, of Eicha on Tishabav because we don't want to end on a down note. Where is those words of consolation in our Torah? Anyone? Everyone, even this morning, we have words of consolation. There's none here. The Rabbi Salvechik says, as Renana just said, there are no words of consolation. This is the exception to the rule. Why? Because the temple can be burnt. The worst calamities can fall the Jewish people. But don't worry. There's always a chance for redemption. We could go through the siege of Tisha B'Av. We could go through the destruction of Shavasa and Ratamus. Anything can befall the Jewish people. There's chance for redemption. But when a Jew sells another Jew into slavery, when a Jew treats another Jew like we read in our Parsha, says Rabbi Salvechik, there is no hope, no hope, no consolation. The Torah is chosen to reflect the sharpness of how terrible our Parsha is. There's no chance. Tisha B'Av we can come back from. Parsha by Yeshev, we cannot. Rabbi Salvechik says that this is the exception to the rule to highlight how grave how terrible what we read in our Parshas. The Torahs are ringing indictment on the Parsha. And the entire structure of that Parsha is to just highlight that notion. There is no consolation for that reason. It's such a powerful, powerful read. Mm. And you read, you read it, it's, it's so clear and it's so, it's so sharp. And even the way it's structured, right? It doesn't talk about you. Duh. It doesn't talk about anyone else. Remember, that was the drawing in. Even the prophet at least had some part where it drew, drew you in. You should feel happy that your enemies are being going to get their, their, their just deserves. Even that, the chazal, our rabbis, legislate, we don't even read that part. We skip it. We freeze frame only on the part that is the destruction for you, to, for Israel. It's a very, very powerful, powerful critique and comment on our Parsha, on our tour. So we covered a lot. We're going to review a little bit. Amos is the reluctant prophet from the south sent to the north, combating the king, Yeravam II, the lion, in his, in his signal. And we see Amos using that rhetoric beautifully, imagery to help undermine and uh, sort of undermine the, pro the idea of the king being the, the prophet, being the leader. We talked about the structure, the three and four structure, which brings the reader in, talks about all your enemies from all around you, north, south, east, west, but then hits you over the head that you ultimately are the, the one that is the most at fault and, and spends the most time. We talked about the challenge of treating others properly, recognizing that when that when they fail, that's not just an affront to others, but that is a chilul Hashem, a desecration of God's name. And on top of that, on top of that, that there, it's not just a desecration of God's name, but this whole interaction shows a fundamental lacking in their understanding of the relationship with God, that it's not just an ATM, you get what you get, you know, what you put in, it's not bribe money to the mob. But it needs to be something there's a higher purpose that the Jewish people miss. Um, and we talked about the special relationship between our Parsha and our Torah, how the rule that every Torah needs to have consolation is actually a, a beautiful shot on our Torah, a, a devastating shot on our Torah. How there's no consolation because while there are certain events that we can come back from, when a Jew sells another Jew into slavery, there is no chance, and therefore our Torah is devoid of any consolation. 
So we'll stop here. This is uh, obviously a very powerful Haftorah and all of Amos is. I believe we have two or three Haftorah from Amos. So we will od chazor, uh, od, uh, what's this? Od chazon l'moed. We'll come back to, uh, uh, to, to Amos and we'll study more. Um, Amos is a short uh, eight chapters. Um, and uh, eight chapters, nine chapters, I don't remember, eight or nine chapters. Um, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, at the end, there is some happy parts of Amos, which we read uh, nine chapters. Um, we read, uh, we read as one of the Haftar wrote, it's uh, Amos uh, fire and brimstone for uh, eight and a half chapters. And it's Amos flowers and roses for the last half chapter. Um, but none of that almost comes through in our story today for obvious reasons. So we'll stop here. Any questions?